hate to break it to you. But if Jesus had a Judas, you will too. It's just a matter of time. But I'm not here tonight to bring you down with, with the news of the bad news of like imminent betrayal. I'm not here to do that. I'm not here to stir up sour emotions about a former friend that did you wrong, that, that betrayed you in some way. But what I am here to do tonight is to remind you guys about the goodness and the grace of God. That's what I'm here to do tonight, to remind you that no matter how many Judases you might have in your lifetime, because let's face it, some of us have more than one, but no matter how many you have, there will always be that one friend that you can make who is never going to let you down, and he is never going to betray you. And luckily for us, luckily for you, he has unlimited grace to give. So this whole series that we're starting, this Unlimited Grace series, this is going to use the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We're going to be in the Gospels, right? And these Gospel accounts are going to demonstrate how Jesus showed grace to the most unlikely and undeserving people. And it's my prayer, it's my hope and my prayer as I prayed through these series and through each message that was assigned that these gospel accounts are going to show you and you're going to start to realize more and more that you're one of the people that God has unlimited grace for. And, and not so that you guys can like do whatever you want and abuse grace. The Bible says we're not to do that. But it, it's so that you can mentally absorb and emotionally process how good our God is. How much he wants to bless you. How much he really, truly, deeply loves you, just as you are, flawed, sinful, imperfect, all of the above. Because I don't know who it is right now, but somebody in our audience is sitting here second-guessing the goodness of God. Someone's really struggling to receive and to accept his grace because maybe they're not feeling worthy. Or maybe it's because they're believing lies that the enemy's whispering to them or that people are saying to them. Maybe it's because of the continual sinful effects of this broken world on you. And to these people, I want to say, pay attention. Pay attention. Take good notes tonight and listen. Listen to what Holy Spirit is trying to tell you. Because he has something to say to you through the word of God, through myself, and through the other teachers in this series. And it's not by accident. No, it's not by accident. It's not by coincidence that we're sharing the things that we're sharing. Not at all. God Almighty himself has chosen each message in this series and carefully given it to each teacher on the Waterstone Young Teaching Team. Because he has a message especially for you. And he has that message especially for you because of his unlimited grace. He wants to give you hope, guys. He wants, he wants to give you a hope because of his grace and because of his love for you. Because guess what? You matter to him. You really matter to him. He created you to matter. And you do, whether you realize it or not. So here's what I'm going to say before we get started. I urge you to fight the distractions that are going to come. And I'm imploring you to fight the spiritual warfare that is going to present itself over the next several weeks out of nowhere to derail you and keep your schedule a little crazy so that you can't make it here on a Wednesday night. I want you to make every attempt to come here with a humble heart and I want you to come here ready to receive what God and Holy Spirit are saying to you, what they have for you. Because make no mistake, he has something for you. When we fully understand and embrace the unlimited grace of God, we become powerful people. So I want you guys to stay prayed up. I want you to be asking God to open your eyes, to have your ears listen intently, and to guard your heart from any and all distractions 
all right? I promise you, if you do that, there is tremendous blessing in it for you. All right, so with all that said and all that out of the way, let's get started, all right? Tonight, we're going to explore the unlimited grace that Jesus showed to his biggest backstabber in the history of backstabbers. His name, as most of you are well aware, is Judas Iscariot. Now, a lot of you guys know already that Judas was one of the disciples, and he followed Jesus around in his three-year earthly ministry, right? We know that he was the backstabber of the bunch. He was the one that sold Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver. He led to, you know, this all led to Jesus' arrest and crucifixion. But other than those two major facts, what else do we know about Judas? Any of you guys have any extra insight about Judas? Anything you know that you can share with us? If you can, raise your hand and uh, we will come around. I'm going to say anyone besides Miss Sarah right now. Anyone else? Miss Sarah, come on up to the platform real quick. Share what you know. Share what you know. Really, no one has anything else about Judas? I guess he's not as well known. All right. He was their money person. So he was in charge of all the money. And it seems kind of, well, not ironic, but that's what he betrayed Jesus for. So he saw the pull of what was going on, and he liked the money aspect of it. He completely missed out on the message part. And he did it for 30 pieces of silver, which incidentally, I find interesting, is actually what a woman, the slave, was worth. And so he did it for the lowest price. And so that's all I know. Good, all fact. Anyone else know anything about Judas? All right. Well, then with that said, thanks, Miss Sarah. We're just going to roll right into this about Judas. All right, here's what we know. So I'm going to build on what Miss Sarah said. When you look at him closely in the Bible, he wasn't just any disciple, right? There's 12 of them. But Judas had a job, as Miss Sarah said. He was the group's treasurer. So he was their money guy. He was in charge of their funds. And that meant that he physically handled the money. He knew where it was going, to whom and when and for what purpose. And he knew, like, how much was spent at any given time. We also know this about him. He was the only non-Galilean of the 12. Now, that might not be like a super important fact, um, but it's, it's, it's kind of interesting to note it because let's, let's talk about this. Bible isn't, it doesn't really say where he's from, but a lot of scholars are thinking that he was from a town called Kerioth, okay? And this was based on his name, Iscariot, um, because it referenced a, a, a town. It referenced an area. It wasn't his last name. You know, like when we say Judas Iscariot, we think like, oh, Judas, his last name Iscariot. That's not what it was. It was referencing a region, an area, which is in and around and near Kerioth. Um, so you want to understand this important fact about him. He was an outsider. He was welcomed into the fold as the only outsider, not from their hometown. And he was not only welcomed as an outsider, he was given the biggest job. Hey, handle all our money. We're going to trust you with it, right? We also know that, interestingly enough, he fit the stereotype of a person that wants to be surrounded by money, a.k.a. he was greedy. He was greedy. Um, but we see this from his betrayal of Jesus, right? He was more concerned with his own pocketbook and his own profit than he was anyone else's. So when he betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, that, and as Miss Sarah said, it's the price of a slave back then, you got to understand more about the amount he received. Now, she mentioned it was the lowest amount for slaves, but it wasn't a low amount of money. It was equal to the quarter of an annual salary. All right, it was a drachma was their money back then. A drachma was approximately a whole day's wage for a skilled laborer. So 30 pieces of silver was called 30 tetradrachm. And four drachms each, do the math, all the math on that means it's comparable to 120 days or four months salary. Four months, all right? So it was a decent chunk of change, y'all. And if you think about it in today's terms, Judas could have put that money on a car, like a down payment for a car. 
He could have paid off a credit card with it. He could have bought an expensive purebred show dog. He could have uh, went on a luxurious vacation for, for a couple of weeks. Heck, the Bible says he could have bought a whole human slave for the life of that sl slave. And slaves weren't cheap, guys. Only the wealthy could really afford to own slaves. Like, you didn't see broke, poor people with them. They usually were the slaves in those times. So when Jesus sold out, or when Judas sold out Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, he was making a business deal. He was making a transaction to benefit himself. He wasn't acting on any noble cause. It was purely based on greed. But there's another side to Judas's greed, and it had nothing to do with money. Nothing to do with money. It had everything to do with power and status. See, Judas, like a lot of the other disciples, didn't initially understand the kingdom that Jesus was talking about. He thought it was a political kingdom. He didn't really understand that at first that Jesus was talking about a spiritual kingdom. But at some point, because he was an intelligent man, obviously, he was dealing with money and whatnot, business deals, he got it. He was like, wait, 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 wait. <laughs> this isn't a political thing. This is about something else. And you know what? More than likely, he struggled with it. More than likely, he, he got a little frustrated by that fact. Maybe a little bit angry. And why? Because he had a desire for money, power, status. And he was not going to have those things addressed by following a guy who had no plans to run for office, so to speak. So when Judas betrayed Jesus, sure, he got a nice chunk of change. But what really took place was that he gained favor from the religious elite. And that could actually do something for him politically. That could help him get some power. So it was really an earthly a desire for earthly power. It was a greed for that over money that drove Judas to betray Jesus, the Messiah and the Son of God. All right. So now we know about Judas. We got all his background, all that insight out of the way. So I want to talk about a very important fact that you can't miss. You have to understand this. A lot of the time when you get betrayed by someone, right, it leaves you shocked, kind of surprised, a little stunned, a little taken aback. And, and that's partly why it hurts so bad, right? Because we never expected it. We didn't see it coming. We considered this person a close friend. But Jesus knew that Judas was going to betray him the whole time, the whole time, before he knew. And we know this from John 670. It tells us this. In, in that verse, it says, Jesus actually says, I chose the 12 of you, but one is a devil. And he was speaking of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, one of the 12 who would later betray him. So hold up. Wait a second. <laughs> okay. Why on earth would Jesus allow Judas to be one of the disciples, one of the 12 exclusive disciples, if he already knew that Judas couldn't be trusted, that he was going to betray him and backstab him? That doesn't make sense. Why would he do it? There's a few reasons, and there's two key ones, really. The first one is that Jesus already knew that Judas' betrayal was part of God's sovereign plan. It had to happen. He knew it. He knew that it needed to happen for him to be crucified and for him to be resurrected, which ultimately afforded everybody grace, future generations grace, because it allows our sinful selves to enter into a relationship with a holy God that can't mix with sin because of a personal relationship that we have with Jesus. So this is like the whole point of Jesus' victory on the cross, right? Because it, it wouldn't be possible without Judas in his role as the betrayer. But why else? Why else did Jesus let him be a disciple? Well, the second key reason is he allowed Judas into his select group of students because of his unlimited grace, which isn't contingent on who we are. Grace is not conditional. It's not transactional. And it does not discriminate. 
We can't earn it. It is strictly something to be given and received as an undeserved gift. Do you guys see now, just from those two responses, that Jesus is like nobody, nobody that you're ever going to meet in your lifetime? It's impossible. Who else can you honestly say consistently shows unlimited grace like that? And with people like Judas, you can't find that person anywhere on earth. You're not going to, unless they're operating out of the power of the Holy Spirit. And in that case, then Jesus gets the glory again. But listen, I want to share with you guys two significant moments in the Bible where Jesus showed incredible grace toward Judas. These two events can be found in all of the Gospels, and they're, they're in there to differing degrees of detail. But tonight we're going to hop between the books of John and Matthew, because depending on the book we're in, you're going to see new levels of detail that's important for understanding the unlimited grace of Christ. So we're going to start with Matthew. If you've got your Bibles, Get to the cha chapter, or the, uh, Ma Matthew, and we're going to go to chapter 26 in Matthew. And we're specifically going to look at Matthew 26, verses 14 through 16. It says, Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve disciples, went to the leading priests and asked, How much will you pay me to betray Jesus to you? And they gave him 30 pieces of silver. From that time on, Judas began looking for an opportunity to betray Jesus. All right, so Judas gets his money, right? Now he's got to make good on his end of the deal, which is to actually betray Jesus. So he's out there make, trying to figure out how to make that happen because political power is at stake. And, you know, what he didn't understand was this. He did not know that Jesus already knew that he was going to betray him. Jesus was already like 85 million steps ahead of Judas. He just didn't know that. But we're going to find out a little more about this. So we're going to get out of Matthew. We're going to flip to John. So go to the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, just give you a reference point. And we're going to go to John chapter 13. All right. We're going to be looking at, um, I'm going to be reading to you from the New Living Translation. But you guys can follow along in any translation that you're in. And we're actually going to be reading verses 1 through 7. 1 through 7. All right. So before the Passover celebration, Jesus knew that his hour had come to leave this world and return to his father. He had loved his disciples during his, er his ministry on earth, and now he loved them to the very end. It was time for supper, and the devil had already prompted Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray Jesus. Jesus knew that the Father had given him authority over everything and that he had come from God and he would return to God. So he got up from the table, took off his robe, wrapped a towel around his waist, and poured water into a basin. And then he began to wash the disciples' feet, drying them with the towel he had around him. When Jesus came to Simon Peter, Peter said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? And Jesus replied, you don't understand now what I'm doing? But someday, you will. Someday, you will. We're going to get to that. So if you have a highlighter or a pen, circle that. Someday, you will. Okay, so let's pause. You have to understand in this scene that Jesus is humbling himself to the lowest of low, low, low servant status. Okay? He's not even the waiter in the restaurant. He's now the bus boy that cleans up after the waiter. He is serving his students. And that is unheard of in his time for a rabbi, for a teacher, an esteemed professor to do. No, it's the other way around. The students wash the teacher's feet. What is he doing? And you want to add another layer of head scratching to this? Jesus knew not only that he was going to be betrayed by Judas, he knew he was going to be denied by another disciple, and he knew that he was going to be deserted by all of them for a time. But still, the passage says at the end of verse 1 
that even then, he loved them to the very end. Love is an action word. It's a verb, (laughs) y'all. Not a noun. It's not in fickle. It's not a feeling. Jesus showed love by doing. He showed love by serving in humility and extending unmerited grace to others, regardless of what they did, what they didn't do, regardless of who they were in their past, who they were in the present, or who they were going to become one day. And by washing their feet, he wasn't just teaching them how to be a servant leader by his own example. He was showing them incredible grace by exalting them or elevating their status in the act of foot washing. Now, did they do anything to earn it in the moment? No way. I just told you guys that Jesus knew what they were all about to do to him. And yet, he extends his grace with genuine compassion, with care, and with love. And why? Because Jesus is grace personified. He's grace in human form. It's just who he is. Notice in verse 7 that Jesus replied to Simon Peter that he didn't understand what Jesus was doing then, but that someday he would. What he was doing then was giving grace. And of course, Simon Peter, you know, he also didn't understand the primary lesson, which was how to be a servant leader and that that's what he was going to need to do moving forward after Jesus, you know, was no longer with him, after he was resurrected and ascended into heaven. But if Simon Peter also knew that he was going to deny Jesus three times, and that Jesus already knew it, then he would really understand the incredible grace that Jesus was showing in washing his feet at that moment. And you know what, guys? It's abundantly clear that Jesus is deliberately extending grace to Judas during that time of foot washing and teaching, starting in verses 10 and 11. And in these verses, Jesus says, a person who has bathed all over doesn't need to wash, except for the feet, to be entirely clean. And you disciples are clean, but not all of you. For Jesus knew who would betray him. That's what he meant when he said, not all of you are clean. If you guys were here at the end of last school year, some of you were, you're going to remember the message that I taught on mercy. It was in the Blessed Bee series. And this is where I discuss the difference between mercy and grace. And I mentioned how a lot of the time you hear these words in church and they're used almost interchangeably. But the reality is while they're similar, they actually do mean very different things. Okay? So let's talk about that in the context of Judas. Now in Judas's case, if Jesus just showed him mercy, he probably would have just dismissed him from the foot washing teaching, or maybe even dismissed him from being a disciple altogether. And this would have been mercy because Judas deserved a punishment for what he was about to do to Jesus. But instead, Jesus chose to offer him grace. He not only allowed Judas to continue on in the time of teaching, but Jesus lovingly washed Judas's dirty feet in total humility. Jesus did not have to do that, guys. He didn't have to do that for the scriptures to be fulfilled. But he did it. He did it out of his loving, unlimited grace. You don't want to miss that. And I want to stop here and I want to say, can you just wrap your brain around that? Think about it if it was you, if you were Jesus. Someone is about to betray you in the most violent, dirty, malicious, selfish way possible. And you're fully aware of it. Like someone told you and you know it's coming. It's going to happen. But you decide you're going to have this tender moment of washing their dirty feet. Like who loves that way? I'm sorry, without Jesus, I don't. I don't love that way. Who offers this kind of ridiculous grace? Only Jesus. Only Jesus. And guess what? He does it for us. Every single day in ways we're not even aware of because we're too busy worrying and focusing about ourselves, on ourselves, guys. 
But here's the thing. When we understand who God is, we understand that he cannot be separated from grace. God, you have to understand grace is not an aspect of who God is. It literally is who he is. And when you think about it from that perspective, why wouldn't you want to grow closer to a God like that? Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you want to know him more intimately and serve him more fully and love him more honestly? I want to just say, if anyone's like struggling right now to kind of understand all of this or to accept it, to believe it, it's probably because you've never met the God of grace before. Like you've never opened your heart to encounter him that way. There's a block there. Because when you remove the block and you invite him in, you will see the God of grace. And you can't unsee it once you've seen it. That's it. Forever. You will see it more and more and more and more. But you have to be willing to be open to see it first. Here's the cool thing about the story of Judas, guys. Judas didn't lose his relationship with Jesus. The reality is, he never really found Jesus in the first place. In John 17, 12, he's called the one headed for destruction because he, never, he was never fully saved. He was never truly saved. You got to remember, when Judas got involved with Jesus, he, he misunderstood the kingdom that Jesus was talking about. He placed hope in Jesus not as Messiah, but as the next big political leader. That's what he was thinking. And once he began to realize what kingdom Jesus was actually talking about, a spiritual one, instead of choosing faith, he chose disillusionment. He chose frustration. He chose abandonment and betrayal. But here's the thing. He always had a choice. He always had a choice. He just chose wrong, which the Bible records that he later realized that he did because he felt so much guilt that he hung himself. And he took his life. But had he truly known Jesus, had he truly understand all the lessons of grace that Jesus was showing him, he would have asked for forgiveness instead of opting for suicide. You guys hear me on that? I don't know who's thinking about suicide. I don't know. Whoever has or whoever will. If you understand the grace that God has for you, you will know that's not an option for you. You don't have to do that. Grace is unlimited. Grace means another chance, another day, favor, goodness, love, blessing, hope, joy, peace. It's unlimited. Fill in the blank. God created everything. He's not limited. And he doesn't want to be limited with you. Why? Because he made you, because you matter, because he loves you. So I'm saying this right now. I went off the grid, Miss Sydney, because if somebody here is thinking about that, has thought about that, and maybe will in the future, I want you to remember Judas didn't have to do that. If he really knew the grace of God, He had a different choice. He had a different choice. Now, I said here, if if Judas understood the lessons on grace that, that Jesus showed him, plural, lessons, right? So far, I've only mentioned one. I've only mentioned feet washing, right? When Jesus was teaching them about servant leadership. But there was another one. There was another one in the Gospels that was an even more powerful teaching. And this was a time that, Jesus graced Judas with before his arrest took place during the Last Supper, all right? And if you want to read a detailed account about the Last Supper, then I would recommend that you go check out the books of Matthew, Mark, or Luke. But I'm not going to share from those books tonight. I'm going to share a less detailed communion version, but one that's more detailed about how Jesus showed grace to Judas. And that's going to be back in in John. So let's get back to the book of John. All right. We're going to get back to chapter 13. So if you were just there, cool. All right. We're going to be reading 
We're going to start with verse 21, and we're just going to go on down, all right? So now, Jesus was deeply troubled, and he exclaimed, I tell you the truth, one of you will betray me. The disciples looked at each other, wondering whom he could mean. The disciple Jesus loved was sitting next to Jesus at the table, and Simon Peter motioned to him to ask, who is he talking about? So that disciple leaned over to Jesus and asked, Lord, who is it? And Jesus responded, it's the one to whom I give the bread I dip in the bowl. And when he had dipped it, he gave it to Judas, son of Simon Iscariot. When Jesus had eaten the bread, or when Judas had eaten the bread, Satan entered into him. And then Jesus told him, hurry and do what you're going to do. None of the others at the table knew what Jesus meant. Since Judas was their treasurer, some just thought Jesus was telling him to go pay for the food or to give money to the poor. So let's talk about exactly how did Jesus show grace to Judas during the Last Supper? Aside from the fact that he was even allowed to be there, you know, that was a very intimate, special dinner, and he's there. So notice how Jesus didn't call Judas out by name. He mentions he's about to be betrayed, and he could have. He could have easily been like, I tell you the truth, Judas will betray me, but he didn't. He didn't. Why? Because Jesus values human life and human dignity. His heart is never to humiliate or degrade what was created by him and the Father. Everything Jesus does drips with grace. Even in conviction, it drips with grace. Because in this very passage, he answers the disciples' question. They asked him, like, who is it? Who's going to betray you? He answers it, but he answers it very graciously. He says it was the one with whom he would give the bread he dipped in the bowl. Now, in biblical times, the honored guest at the table was singled out that way. So this is most likely why the disciples didn't quite grasp that Jesus was revealing Judas as the betrayer. So let's think about this. Judas is allowed to be part of this private, intimate, special meal with the disciples. He's able to partake in the very first communion. He's not called out by name as the backstabber that he is. And if we flip to Matthew, if you guys want to flip to Matthew 26, and you can go to verse 30, you're going to see that Judas also got a chance to worship with everyone as well. Now, the book of John doesn't mention the time of worship afterward. It states that Judas left after Jesus dismissed him to hurry and do what you're going to do. Yet, we don't read of that account in the other three Gospels. So perhaps Judas participated in the worship, or maybe he left before it happened. But I'll tell you what, if he was allowed to be at that dinner, then you better believe he was probably allowed to worship with them. Jesus isn't going to be like, you can do this, but not this. Like, if Jesus is showing grace, he's showing grace. He goes all the way, right? He's not a halfway God. He's an all the way God. What it all boils down to, guys, is unlimited grace. Unlimited grace. It was a privilege to dine with Jesus for his very last teaching, which was reserved for the 12 disciples. It was nothing short of an honor. And Jesus could have just stopped Judas at the door. He could have, like, quietly and discreetly sent him on his way and been like, hurry and do what you're going to do before he even came in. But he graced him with an opportunity for fellowship, for teaching, for community. Jesus had no other agenda than to love through the extension of grace. And Jesus has no other agenda with us than to love through extensions of grace in our lives every single day. It's easy for us to become angered or shocked by what Judas did to Jesus. But are we really that different from him? Think about it for a minute. If you profess to commit to Jesus and then you deny him by not following him or obeying him, it's betraying him. What if you choose to, like, hesitate in obeying? It's like, you're going to do it, but just not right now. You're still denying him. You're denying his love because in whatever he's calling you to do, it's it's an act of love of why he's calling you to do it. Because he's going to grace you somehow. So when we doubt or we distrust either Jesus or the promises of his word, all right, right now, let's try this. 
every single hand will go up. Every single hand, including mine. Promise of the word of God, Jeremiah 29, 11. Who knows it? Who can say it? Anybody. Ryan, I know you know it. Who knows it? For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you, to give you a future and a hope. Right? So what does that mean? God's got good stuff coming. Right? How many of you are freaking out about college or or are you going to break up with your boyfriend or girlfriend or I just crashed the car, what's going to happen? Are we hanging on to that promise that he's got good things? So can we all put our hands up? Let's all do it in humility, in humility, because it's impossible for you to not put your hand up. We're all human. Okay, I've done it many times, many times probably do it many more times. And I'm a youth director, guys. doesn't matter. I'm still human. But guess what? Makes me a little bit like Judas because I'm still betraying Jesus. It's all varying forms of betrayal. So, yes, we all have a Judas in our life, but we also all are a Judas. But unlike Judas, we can choose to know Christ intimately, not just for what we think he can do for us, like Judas did, but who he is as grace, as unlimited grace. We can choose to believe in his kingdom and place our eyes and our hopes upon the things of above. We can choose to receive his grace and his mercy and his forgiveness in full. We don't have to choose betrayal and death like Judas. We can choose life and life abundant. And it all begins with humbly recognizing that we're all a little like Judas from time to time, and we all need the unlimited grace of God to repent and live the redeemed lives that Christ died and rose for us to have for his glory. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, your word is powerful, God. It keeps us grounded. It reminds us that we don't have it all together, and we don't have to. We're not supposed to. Your word kind of gives relief to us, Lord, because it takes the weight off of us. We don't have to think we're better than Judas. We would never do that to you, God. Because guess what? We do it all the time, Lord. And you know what? I can say this to you because I know you love us. It's not about what we do or don't do, Lord. It's about who you are. That your grace, that it doesn't run out. There's a song lyric that says your grace is an ocean. It's beyond an ocean, Lord. That doesn't even do it justice. And we don't want to abuse your grace, God. Help us not to do that. Help us not to be flippant and go, oh, you know, I can do whatever I want because Jesus loves me. We want to honor you. We want to respect you. We want to show you that we believe in who you are. That you are the one and only true God. And that you are a good God and that you love us and you have unlimited grace for us as your children. Because we matter. Because you made us to matter. So, Lord, I thank you for the message tonight. I pray that we think about it, that we process it, that we ask questions, that we go back to these scriptures, that we reread the the Last Supper and we reread about the, the foot washing of the disciples. And we just let you speak to us. And I pray, God, as we go into our mentor time, mentor huddles, that maybe we can process your grace in our lives. So thank you, Lord, for everything that you're doing, for who you are, and we love you, and we just want you to know it. It's in Jesus' unmatchless name that I pray. Amen. All right, guys, we're going to have Miss Raya and Mr. Jordan come up to do highlights. Give them a round of applause. Woo-hoo! Miss Raya, what do we have going on? Tell us. So it's just going to be, oh, he's here. Oh, my gosh, he made it. Wow. Rumor has it he ran all the way from Lyman High School to get here. I'm just kidding. He didn't. All right. So what did you guys think of the first message of the series? Yeah. So Jordan and I, we have an announcement for you that that is really near and dear to our heart. So uh, Miss Anna and some other leaders are going to be gone on a trip to Israel. Everybody say whoop, whoop. 
And during one of those weeks, we will not be having students, and that is the 26th. But the other Wednesday, we will be. This is in November, the first Wednesday of November, and we're going to be doing something pretty crazy that we have never done before. Can I get a drum roll, please, for what we're going to be doing? We are going to be having a special event in which you can participate, a talent show! So excited. So we are going to be having a talent show. You're going to register online, and you're going to tell us what your talent is. Now, some examples of talents can be song and dance. Any examples? Hey, ha. Uh, he gave an actual example. Oh, you mean like examples? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, what else? What else? Like okay, we've got this. What's he about to do? Yo, ready? Ready? Go. Oh, that's an example. Okay, so you can come up. You can do a trick. You can tell a joke. You can do magic tricks. Uh, uh, rap. Uh, now, Jordan, what's the best part about this whole night? And it starts with the C and ends with the fillet. Oh, it's Chick-fil-A. Yeah. Yo. Chick-fil-A is catered that night. No need to eat before coming because there will be food. Bring some friends and register. Now, there's options. When you register, you can have a team or you can go solo. Now, what's the prize, Raya Grace? This might just be the best part. Also, leaders can participate too. So leaders, leaders, if you want to team up with some students, you can do that. Now, listen up. I need for my single prizers. This is what you're going to get. You are going to get a $50 Visa gift card for being the best single. And if you are in a group, what is it, four, Anna? In a group of four and you win best group, you each get $25 of a Visa gift card, which is like, oh, Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A, Chick-fil-A gift card. So that's really exciting. Jordan and I are going to be hosting. All your leaders are going to be here. You can show up, do anything you want. Uh, well, maybe not anything. Um, and, and it's going to be awesome. But, here's the but. It has to be registered, and you have to put down what you're doing because it can't be anything, you know, too crazy. We got we to gotta be, be able to pass it, you know. But uh, you guys have to be able to register by the 26th. Now, that is the cutoff date. If you don't register by then, then you don't have any more talent, okay? <laughs> and <laughs> I think that's right. Yeah. Okay. Is that everything? Oh, and that little snippet, that little sample you guys got tonight of the best rap you ever heard, it's going to be here again on the, what, what day is it? She's closing off the talent show, which is November 3rd. Second, November 2nd, Megan Tossi closing it off. Your talent started it off. We're going to have singing, dancing, acting, stand-up comedy, everything. So who's excited? Let's go. All right, everybody, find your – oh. Okay, and just in case any of you guys were wondering, this is a great opportunity to bring some friends because it's so much fun and goofy. And if you want to, now I know this sounds a little crazy, if your talent is a group talent, you can bring a friend and have the friend be in the group talent. What's your question? It could be. We'll see. But now. Mentor Holly! Mentor Holly! 